Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first of a three-series tableting webinar hosted by Natoli Scientific. We are excited to share with you our tablet development technologies, including direct compression, dry granulation, wet granulation, and the tableting process. My name is Carrie Cruz, and I am an office manager and lab technician for Natoli Scientific in Telford, Pennsylvania, and I will be moderating this webinar series. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping tips. Our presenters will be sharing their slides, and if you would like to see all the presenters, please select all in the drop-down menu. Also, you will be muted during the webinar, so please write your comments and questions in the chat box, and I will address them. Also, at the end of the presentation, there is a QR code that you can easily scan with your camera to provide the feedback to the presenters. And finally, any questions we do not get to by the end of the webinar, we will reach out to you directly. So with that out of the way, I would like to hand this over to Robert Sedlock, the director of Natoli and his, oh, sorry, <laughs> Natoli Scientific. He is a leading expert in the tablet compression industry with over 20 years of experience and has authored numerous technical papers for pharmaceutical technology, American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, and peer-reviewed journals. Mr. Sedlock is responsible for solid dosage customer support, training seminars, contract compression services, and continuous research in collaboration with many universities worldwide. Robert? All right, thank you, Carrie. Yes, my name is Robert Sedlock with Natoli Scientific. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are in the globe. If you're in the Northeast like we are, you probably got hammered with a lot of snow. We got about two feet of snow here in Pennsylvania, about 0.6 meters. So. Uh, a lot of us in uh, the Northeast here are having some commute issues, uh, but I'm glad we're able to continue with this webinar. So just to give you a little background of Natoli. Natoli Engineering was founded in 1973 by the late Carmelo Natoli, uh, now being run, run by Dale Natoli, who is our president and CEO. Natoli Engineering is located in St. Charles, Missouri. Uh, it's a 120,000 square foot facility and campus which includes our compression tool manufacturing, our tablet press manufacturing, from single station to R&D rotary to production scale tableting, uh, all with the AIM data acquisition system. Uh, we offer spare parts for all tablet presses, not just Natoli machines, all the common industry machines out there. We offer a full line of spare parts and accessories. Uh, we also offer parts and equipment for encapsulators. Um, and the industries that we serve is, is very wide range. We, we serve the pharmaceutical industry, the nutraceutical industry, uh, the food, confectionery, the cannabis industry, and even industrial applications. Uh, Natoli has many off-site facilities and service centers, um, and we work with many universities worldwide to combat tableting issues. Uh, some of the service centers that are, we have in the globe located in Long Island, New York, Cypress, California, Poland and the Tolly Scientific, where I'm based at in Cary, uh, is in Telford, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is over a 12,000 square foot facility where we offer R&D and scale up contract services. Uh, we also have a training center here and the facility is equipped with the full line of solid doses equipment. Uh, we have blending capabilities from two quart all up to 25 cubic feet. Uh, we've got high shear granulation, we have dry roller compaction, we have film coating capabilities, um, we have a whole line of tablet presses from compaction emulator, which we're going to talk about today, uh, to single station machines, to R&D rotary, to production scale rotary tablet presses. Uh, we do have a lot of focus here on micromoretics, evaluating particle size distribution, uh, the blending characterization, the, the moisture content. Uh, and flowability tests. So we perform all of these tests for our customers that are having any type of issues in R&D all the way to production, especially that scale up stage that seems to be a big disconnect from R&D and manufacturing. So at Natoli Scientific, we focus on the scalability and transfer from R&D into production. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand that back over to uh, Carrie. Thank you, Robert. For this first webinar series, we were fortunate enough to work with Brand New Tools and Dr. Aurelian Nabu. Granutools, located in Iwan, Belgium, improves powder understanding by delivering leading edge physical characterization tools. Combining decades of experience in scientific instrumentation with fundamental research on powder characterization, Granutools offers a unique set of complementary instruments. Joining us today is Dr. Aurelian Nivu, 
Dr. Nabu's research activities mainly focus on the understanding of granular materials and powders at different scales. During his PhD, he has developed discrete numerical models to describe fragmentation mechanics of cohesive granular materials by taking into account the complex microproperties of the grain. He then moved to a larger scale to study segregation in gravity-driven rapid flows as well as aeolian transport of granular materials with huge implications on natural disasters. He is now working as a particle scientist at Granny Tools Company, performing research on powder characterization. Now to quickly review our agenda for today. First, or doc first Dr. Nabu will speak about how proper characterization of powders can help develop high-end products with improved performance. He will introduce you to a state-of-the-art tapped density measurement method called the GranuPack. He will then focus on applying the information gathered from the powder characterization to a practical investigation of the powder performance in a tableting process. After Dr. Navu, Robert will discuss the details of compaction emulation and material deformation properties. And without further delay, I will let Dr. Navu take over from here. Thank you, Kerry, for the nice introduction. So hello, everyone. Uh, so today we will talk about powder characterization. Uh, why do we need to characterize our powder? How we can do that? And what we can get from this characterization? So this is the outline of my presentation. So, so first, I will give you some fundamentals on powder properties, what we uh, have to measure depending on the process. A new, I will introduce you to a new uh, tap density analysis and we will apply it to a, a case study. So first, some fundamental on powder properties. So powder are uh, very complex materials. They are made of an assembly of particles that interact through contact and all this interaction will lead to a collective behavior, the flow behavior, for example. So the grains composing the powder can have different size, different shape, surface roughness, physico-chemical properties, and they will interact via uh, different kinds of forces. So of course, they are all submitted to gravity. They can interact through contact forces when they touch each other, so mainly friction, but also all cohesive uh, forces, cohesive interactions, uh, mainly Van der Waals forces, electrostatic forces when you have a charge buildup inside your powder due to uh, tribal charging. Also capillary forces, if you have moisture inside your powder, you will have capillary bridges between the grains that contributes to the uh, cohesive forces. And if the grains are surrounded by a gas or a liquid, you may have also hydrodynamic forces. So the global behavior of your powder uh, will be an interplay between the, these cohesive forces and the weight of the grain. So you can define uh, what we call a granular bond number, which is a ratio of all the cohesive forces acting on a grain over its weight. And if the uh, bond number is below one, the, po <clears throat> the powder behavior will, will be driven by, by inertia, so by the weight of the, of the grains. And you will be like in the case in left here, in the case of a non-cohesive or low cohesive powder. At the opposite, if these cohesive interactions are uh, predominant um, over the weight of the particle, so especially when you have very small and light grains, you will have a more cohesive powder. And when we deal with powder in general, we are more in the case of cohesive powder. So in this case, the behavior of your powder will be driven by cohesion. So what can we measure actually? So interaction between the grains, all these uh, contact forces or cohesive forces, usually it's impossible to, to measure it in general. You cannot go inside your powder, measure the force between the particles. And even if you were able to measure these interactions, we don't usually don't know the uh, micro to macro relation to relate these uh, cohesive forces, these forces to the uh, microscopic properties of the powder, its flow properties, for example. So it's still very challenging now to have theoretical uh, models. 
also you can measure the microscopic properties, the flow properties, cohesion properties, or rheology, and that we can do. We know how to do, and this is the, the topic of this presentation. So usually, in general, uh, when you want to characterize your powder, you are only able to measure these microscopic properties. Also, very important to understand, the powder in the process can be submitted to different stray state or, or shear uh, state. And you have to choose the correct uh, characterization method that match the straight state at which your powder is submitted in your process. So if you are in a condition of high stress and low uh, shear, for example, storage in a silo, you have to select a characterization method that will produce this high stress and low shear, and probably you will uh, choose a shear set. If you are investigating a uh, pharma mixer, mixing of powder, uh, dye filling, or um, compression, and so on, you have to choose a method that match uh, what you are um, investigating, so rotating drum or uh, a tap density uh, method. So, if we take the case of a uh, uh, tableting uh, system, here we have a, a scheme of a, a tableting uh, procedure. You can identify at least two different stages. So the dye filling stage, where the powder flows through the dye, and the compression stage. If we look at the dye filling stage, probably you will be interested in the powder flowability. How the powder will flow through the dye, do you have a consistent uh, mass or low mass variability? And so you will characterize your powder in terms of flowability. If we look at uh, the compression stage, when you are uh, compressing the, the powder to, to make the tablet, you will probably be more interesting in the packing ability of the powder. Are your powder able, able to pack well or not? And also uh, the kinematics of the packing. So do you need a fast kinematics, a powder that pack fast or slow? So it will depend on your process. So in this, if you look at this stage of the process, you will want to investigate the packing uh, properties. Of course, there are also process uh, parameters like uh, compression rate, compression force, and so on. And all of that have to be taken into account. So let's uh, have a look at uh, one very uh, commonly used characterization method, which is a tap density analysis. So the tap density analysis, it's a very uh, easy uh, method to, to, to use. So the principle is very simple. You have a silent recall cell, you pour the powder inside the cell, and then you will apply taps to this cell. So the cell will move upward and then experience free fall. And of course, uh, after each tap, the powder will pack. So the bulk density of the powder will increase. So this uh, characterization method is a well-documented. It's a standardized method, uh, easy to perform, um, fast method. But it has some drawbacks. So the standardized uh, method uh, needs a visual assessment of the uh, powder high to measure the volume of powder. And this introduces a lot of user dependency. Uh, so it's not too much accurate method. It requires also a large amount of powder. So of course, if we want to go further by understanding the behavior of our powder, we need a more and more accurate and repeatable uh, measurement method. So that was the uh, goal of the development of a new instrument by Granitools company. So this is a granule pack. So you have a picture of the instrument here. So it's rely on exactly the same uh, method. So you have a, a cell, a cylindrical cell, which is here. The powder is inside the cell and you will apply taps to the cell. So the improvement uh, of the method uh, given by the GranuPack is uh, both we use a special initialization protocol to remove all the user dependency, and also we use a, a very precise sensor to measure the powder height. So when we do a measurement, first this tube here, the initialization tubes go uh, downwards inside the cell. We pour the powder inside the tube, and then the tube will move upward. 
so that the powder is always poured exactly the same way. So you remove the user dependency on the pouring of the powder. Then the uh, inductive sensor will go, will come in the vicinity uh, of the powder, and you can measure very accurately the uh, high and thus the volume of the powder after each tap. So here are the measurable you can get with the, the tap density analysis. So the bulk density, uh, which is defined as the mass of the powder of the sample over its volume. So it's different than the uh, material density because the bulk density includes also the void uh, inside the powder. The very classic Osner ratio uh, parameter, which is the ratio between the tapped density, so the density, the bulk density of the powder after a certain number of taps over its initial density, so the density when you just pour the powder. And of course, then if you have access to the material density, you can uh, define the, the packing fraction. So here on the right, you have typical curves we can get with a, with a granule pack. So with a standardized um, tap density analysis, actually you only have two points, uh, the initial uh, density and the tapped density. With the granule pack, as we use uh, uh, the sensor, we can measure the bulk density evolution after each tap so that we have the complete packing curves. And it's very interesting because we can look at the dynamics of the packing. So we define two uh, measures of the dynamics of the packing. So the n half parameter, which is the number of taps to reach half of the packing, yeah, and the slope index. So today we will uh, I will present results with the slope index, which is the slope of the initial part uh, of the curve, the linear evolution of the uh, packing. So the higher the slope index the faster the packing. So we have both information, how the powder will pack with the Osner ratio. So the Osner ratio is also a measure of uh, powder flowability because the more cohesive the powder, the higher the Osner ratio and also the um, lower the flowability. So higher Osner ratio, lower flowability. And if we look at the slope index, we can have uh, a measure of the kinematics of the packing. So the higher the slope index, the uh, faster the packing. So we have both information. So I recall uh, we just talked before about uh, the tableting process where you have these two parts, the diffing part, we will be more interesting in the flowability and the packing uh, compression stage, we will be more interesting in the packing dynamics. So we will apply now uh, this uh, characterization method to a case study, so we will investigate the influence of a drug load on blend properties, so a very practical case. Uh, so imagine uh, you have a different drug load, you prepare your formulation and you want to know, to characterize your powder, to know beforehand how your powder will uh, perform in the machine. So we did, uh, in collaboration with Natoli, uh, different uh, tests uh, on the granule pack. So we use um, a ProSol uh, 90, 0.5 percent of magnesium steroid, and we blend it with uh, APAP at different uh, percentage in mass, 20, 40, 60 percent in mass, so that we can investigate the influence of the uh, percentage of APAP, so the drug load, to uh, the behavior of the powder of the blends. We also investigated three different production methods, so direct compression, roller compaction, and wet granulation. Of course, these three different production methods leads to different uh, particle uh, size and shape, and this will also influence the uh, behavior of the powder. So I won't go uh, into details uh, on this method because Robert will uh, talk about it a little bit more uh, in the second presentation. So question is, okay, we have different blends with different uh, drug loads, and what are the influence of the drug loads on the uh, powder behavior? So here are the results we get with the granule pack measurements. So on the left here, you have the bulk density versus the number of taps. Uh, in blue, the blue curves are the uh, roller compacted uh, powder, uh, orange it's direct compression and wet granulation in blue. So first, uh, as you see, when we increase the drug loads, 
So here, uh, solid lines is uh, zero percent, no drug, and we increase the drug load. We clearly see uh, an influence on the packing behavior. It's, it's very clear. We have a shift in the curve. Um, so when we increase the drug load, we change uh, fundamentally the, the packing behavior. Uh, you can see also that in green here, we have the wet granulation curves. The effect seems to be uh, less important on wet granulation. So this is also an information on the influence of the production method. If we look at the right, we have uh, the bell density after 500 taps, so here, versus the uh, percentage of APAP. And we see the same, what we see here, we increase the drug load, we increase the uh, bulk density uh, of the uh, packed uh, powder. We clearly see again that the wet granulation process is much uh, less influenced by uh, the drug load. So this is first information, the drug load influences the packing behavior. Now, if we look at the Osner ratio, so again, Osner ratio is a ratio between the tapped density over the initial density of the powder, and uh, it's a measure of the flowability, just because a very cohesive powder we will have um, a lower uh, initial density because the cohesive interaction between the particles allows to sustain a very loose packing. So you have a, a larger range to pack your powder. So the higher the Osner ratio, the lower the flowability. So if we look at the evolution of the Osner ratio for different drug load, we clearly see an increase of the Osner ratio with the drug load, which means when we increase the drug load, the flowability of the powder decreases. So this is important in terms of uh, processability of the powder, because uh, if we stay on the tableting um, problem, uh, we have we want the best flowability so that we can achieve a very consistent mass uh, in the dye when we fill the dye. And what we see here by characterizing the powder is that if we increase the drug load, we decrease the flowability, or maybe we can expect to have uh, some problems in terms of uh, variability of uh, mass of the tablets. So this is another uh, important information we can get from the characterization. Now, if we look at the dynamic parameter, so the slope index, so the higher the slope index, the uh, faster the dynamic. So here we can look at the kinematics of the packing, how fast our powder will pack. Um, we see something which is uh, actually counterintuitive because we see that if we increase the drug load, we uh, increase the slope index together. And so the packing becomes faster. And it's not very intuitive because usually uh, a more cohesive powder, you can imagine the powder um, uh, will pack uh, more slowly just because the cohesive interaction will prevent the grains to, re to rearrange freely. Uh, but we, we see the opposite uh, here. So we see that if we increase the drug load, it packs faster. And it may have uh, some implication on uh, the tableting process. But now we need to correlate with the process. We need to see uh, in the tableting machine, uh, do we need a fast packing or a slow packing? We don't know. I don't know yet. So we have to, to correlate uh, with the process and we have to measure in the machine and to see, okay, with this powder, with these blends, uh, a fast packing is better to achieve uh, better uh, tablet properties. Again, the uh, wet granulate powder produced by wet granulation seems to be uh, less influenced by the drug load. This is also uh, an important information. So uh, here is the conclusion. So to conclude, powder is a very complex material. Uh, we don't know a uh, lot of things. I mean, theoretically speaking, on the behavior of powder. Um, we have usually different, uh, a lot of grain sizes, a lot of uh, grain uh, shapes, and all of that will influence the, the behavior of the powder. And it's impossible to take everything into account. We don't have the theoretical models to do that. We don't have 
the uh, way to measure uh, these forces between the particles. So we have to characterize the problem. Uh, we have to characterize and we have to correlate with the process. We, you have to characterize your powder beforehand, you have to look at what's happened in your specific process, and you have to try to, um, with both of the information, try to uh, develop better, better powder, better po product for your process. So micro characterization it will be always necessary uh, to evaluate the powder beforehand. So today I introduce you to one of these characterization methods, which is the tap density analysis. Uh, tap density analysis, as you saw, gives, it's a very simple characterization method, but it gives a lot of very useful information to understand the uh, behavior of the powder, to understand the influence of soft parameters. So today we investigated two parameters, the drug loads and the production method, but of course you can evaluate all the lot of other parameters. And what we observe is uh, when we increase the drug load, we decrease the, fl the flowability. But we also observe that the packing becomes faster with a uh, higher drug load, which is a very interesting information. Uh, and now we have to continue to work on it to, to see if it's ben beneficial to have a faster packing or not. Uh, also, we observe in terms of production methods that wet granulation seems to be less influenced by uh, the drug load. So maybe uh, probably the better method in terms of uh, particle properties, uh, because of course it's better if uh, the drug load is not uh, too much influencing the, the flowability of the powder. And I will finish uh, by saying that uh, this is only the beginning of the story. There is a lot of things to do and uh, to understand the behavior of this very complex material, which is the powders. So now we can also include influence of the speed of the process, for example, so rheology, uh, rheological characterization. We can investigate electrostatics, which is a, a major problem usually, in, especially in continuous manufacturing. So we can investigate the influence of uh, tribal charging, charge buildup in the powder, and there is a lot of things to do. So this is only the start uh, of the story and um, uh, please uh, co continue to try to understand uh, the behavior of your product is very fundamental. So thank you very much for your attention. Here are my contact details. details. Don't hesitate to reach me uh, if you have a uh, question. So thank you. Thank you Aurelian for the excellent overview of powder characterizing tools. Robert will now present the details of compaction emulation in evaluating material deformation properties. Robert? Okay, thank you. Just want to get my screen up here. Can you guys view my screen? No, not yet. There we go. How's that? Can you guys see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Aurelian. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, nice presentation on on powder characteristics as far as flow, tap density, and evaluating the raw materials. Now what we're gonna do is take those formulations and we're gonna move them onto the tablet press. Uh, but we're gonna do something a little different uh, where we're gonna look at the compaction emulator. Uh, here's a, an image here of many different Natoli machines. Uh, the typical process that we follow is we start on a single station tablet press where we only need maybe a gram or less than a gram of material and we can compress this and understand how much uh, dosing is required based off the bulk density to achieve the weight and we can understand how much compression is needed to achieve a robust tablet. So it's a very uh, useful machine on a small scale. Then we move into the rotary tablet press which is the RD30. We're actually gonna run data on this machine for the series two and three 
Uh, but then after you run the RD30, you go into your larger scale-up machine and then into manufacturing. Um, that's a typical process. And what we're going to talk about today is the presser. This is a compaction emulator. This is like a rotary tallet press, but in a linear fashion. And it's going to go through the whole cycle of the dosing, uh, pre-compression, main compression, ejection, and takeoff. Um, and this machine is highly instrumented to give us displacement data and force data and speed data. So the advantages of a compaction emulator, like I said, you typically run on a small single station, then you go to a rotary, then a large scale. You're going to need lots of material. We're going to need to do this anyway, but the advantage of the emulator is to understand the material deformation properties at a very small scale material, so less than five grams. Depending on the weight, you could probably do this in less than maybe one or two grams. Um, and we can reach up to one meter per second on the linear velocity. It actually can reach up to two meters per second, but we, we run at one meter per second because that's where typical manufacturing runs at. Um, so like Aurelian said, we, we've got uh, three different methods. We have a direct compression, roller compaction, and wet granulation. And we're going to compare the drug loads of APAP at 20% mass, 40%, and 60% for all of these three processes. We use silicified microcrystal cellulose from JRS Pharma, a very nice uh, diluent, very compactable material. And we're also using 0.5% by weight of magnesium stearate. Uh, we follow the, the typical blending procedure using the SIS and the blending operation and the order of blending as well. So what is the compaction emulator and what does it do? Well, it's a linear track and it starts with the punch carriage and you got an upper punch, you got a lower punch and you have a die. You fill your material manually or you can use the feed shoe. And then it goes to the dosing adjustment. So fill cam overfills, dosing pushes out the excess and scrapes it off to achieve the weight. Then it goes to a pre-compression and a main compression stage. The advantage of this emulator is you can remove these rollers out and replace them with other rollers that will fit your manufacturing press. So if you're using an Atoli MP500, for example, in production, we know what the roll diameter is. We can actually replace these compression rollers with the exact diameter of that MP500. So now we're going to be matching um, the consolidation time. Um, the punches and the punch head flat will determine the dwell time. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But after compression, we then have the ejection stage. So we have to remove the tablet from the die wall, overcome that residual die wall force and that coefficient of friction between the belly band of the tablet and the die wall surface. Then we have to remove it with a takeoff bar. So it goes through this whole process in a linear track at one meter per second or whatever speed you want to achieve uh, your scalability in the manufacturing. So that being said, let's talk about the rotary press process. This is almost identical, but we should understand how the rotary press works um, because this is true for about 99% of all rotary machines. There is a machine out there called the Ema Caprima. Uh, it doesn't follow this, this principle. Um, it's similar, but it doesn't follow all these steps. But every other machine out in the industry is going to follow these steps. So I think it's important that we understand this. So... This is your turret, and you have your upper punches installed. Here's your die table with your dies installed. Uh, then you have your lower punches. The first step is the die filling, just like I showed you on the Prester. What's going to happen is you have a fill cam that's going to pull the lower punch down and overfill the die. And you'll notice that when this image here is showing you that the lower punch is being pulled down, there's granulation and powder going into the dies. That is a super super critical event. There are many old tablet presses out in the industry or even some new presses that are designed like the old model where the fill cam is not positioned properly. It's not pulling in material. So it's actually pulling the punch down, but there's air. There's no powder above it. Then it comes underneath the feeder and it falls into the die. Hopefully the powder has great flow properties and gravity allows it to flow in that die. But if your fill cam is positioned in the cor correct spot, this lower cam pulls the lower punch and the clearance between the die tip and the, and the uh, lower punch tip and the die is going to create a vacuum. So it's actually going to assist and suck the material from the feeder into the die. So it's very important that you have your fill cam positioned underneath the, uh, the feeder. Um, if your machine doesn't have this, please contact Natoli. We can design this cam specifically for your press to uh, make this occurrence happen. After you overfill the die, now you have the volume adjustment. This is where the operator can adjust the dosing cam and it's going to push out the excess and scrape it off. This is where we achieve our tablet weight. 
So there's a two-step process. You overfill your dye, and as you push out the excess, it consolidates the particles to make a more consistent fill. That's very important. So you want to overfill your dye, but you don't want to overfill too much. Two to four millimeters of overfill is appropriate for most powders. Pore flowing powders, you might need more, but you typically want no more than two to four millimeters of overfill. Okay, then after the uh, the dosing, you have the volume reduction and consolidation. You have a pre-compression stage and you have a main compression stage. In R&D, I recommend you don't use pre-compression because you want to develop your formula such that you make a robust tablet and you don't need pre-compression. If you have any capping issues or robustness issues, you want to formulate it so that you fix that problem, not by adding pre-compression. Because now when you scale this process up into manufacturing, and now you're using large-scale machines with large turrets running at low dwell times, if you run into any of these compression issues like capping, robustness, lamination, uh, you can use pre-compression as a backup tool. But if you develop a pre-compression, you're going to need it in manufacturing. And if you have any of these issues, you don't have a backup tool. So as a formulating scientist, you want to develop your formulated formula such that you don't need any pre-compression. Um, after pre-compression, you have your main compression. The main compression is where we're actually going to uh, deform the particles and, and make a compact. Uh, one common uh, industry issue I see with pre-compression is we're putting too much pre-compression force on. The pre-compression is just to consolidate the particles and get them touching each other. Then when the main compression hits, it actually deforms it and bonds it. So if you create bonding at the pre-compression with too much force, you're going to have issues with your tablets when you hit it with the main compression. So you got pre-compression, you got main compression. Uh, one thing to know about the main compression is one of the roles is going to adjust to change your thickness, your hardness, and your force. The opposite role is going to be your punch penetration. Where in the die do you want to make your tablet? Typically we like to make it the top part of the, the, the die so there's less ejection and the air is removed easily when it's at the high part. But you have the ability to adjust where to make that tablet in the die based off your punch penetration. After the compression you have the decompression. So after we apply a load to that powder make a tablet, the upper punch is released first. The tablet wants to expand upward because that's where you release the load. So at the decompression event, the lower punch is still contacting the lower part of the surface of the tablet, but the upper punch is released and it expands upward. This is why we see capping on the top side of the tablet. Uh, and as soon as it peeks out of that die, all those internal forces pushes out and the tablet just pops out and it looks like a hat just popped off. Uh, so that's capping. After the decompression event, you have two more steps. This is confused as one step, but note that the ejection has to remove the tablet from the die wall. It has to overcome the residual die wall force and the friction. So after you overcome that force and friction, the tablet's now removed from the die, and then you have the takeoff stage where the lower punch must remove the, uh, the tablet from the lower punch face with a takeoff bar. So as the punch comes by, ejects, it hits a takeoff bar and it removes it from a lower punch face. So if you have any sticking or picking issues, that is different than an ejection issue. Uh, we will address those differently. Uh, with sticking issues, Natoli has a lot of focus on this because it's probably the number one uh, tablet defect in manufacturing. So Natoli offers different steel types and coatings and, and uh, we, we modify logos with different engraving cuts. Uh, so there's a lot of work and effort on uh, preventing these sticking issues, which is different from ejection issues, okay? All right, we're gonna focus on the compression event. So what we're looking at here is one compression event. And since the prester or the compaction emulator has displacement sensors on the punches, we're able to measure the real in-die tablet thickness. Okay, so as we're increasing our compression force, we're actually measuring the lower punch displacement and the upper punch displacement. By doing this and measuring this, we can now look at workers and heckle plots and picker plots, Kawakita plots. This will allow us to characterize the deformation properties of the, uh, the material under this compaction emulator. Um, there are machines out there, rotary presses that claim to do heckle plots and work curves. Those are just, uh, th those are calculated data. Uh, the emulators, the simulators, we actually measure this data and we take into account the machine compliance. So as we're adding compression, the machine's going to stretch a little bit. 
that's an error that you need to correct for. So these software programs in our emulators and simulators are going to correct for the machine deformation properties. But take a close look at this. When we're applying a load to our powder, this is called the consolidation time. This is when the particles are starting to get closely packed together. Um, this time is a function of the compression roll diameter and the turret's tangential velocity. So if we've got a really large roller, that punch is going to hit the roller, it's going to come down and compress, versus a very small roller, that punch hits the roller, comes down real fast. So the smaller the roller, at a constant tangential velocity, the less consolidation time. Consolidation time is very important to us because it gets the air out, it consolidates the particles, and then under the peak force or dwell time, we're actually deforming the material and creating bonding plastic deformation, okay? Some programs will use 10% of peak to 90% of peak for consolidation. This particular example using the peak, and the dwell time we're saying is from peak to 20% down here. Some programs use 90% of peak to 90% to the unloading as dwell. Time's still the same, and that's a function of your head flat. So if you've got a large head flat, it hits the roll, and it's under the head flat for a long time, that time in milliseconds is called the dwell time. Okay, then after the dwell time, the upper punch is released and you have the relaxation time or the decompression event. All right, so this is one compression event and this is what we're going to focus on and understand the material deformation properties of our examples. This is one common plot that we use. This is called a work plot. And what this work plot does is it measures the real time tablet thickness as we're adding compaction pressure. So you'll notice in this example of a plastic material, as we're increasing compression force or compaction pressure, the tablet's getting thinner, thinner, and thinner. This is our in-die tablet thickness. And when we release the load from the up punch, this right here is the relaxation. So if it curves inward and gives you less area, that means it's pushing out that work. So you apply all this work in here, and this material might push that out. This one isn't pushing out much. It just got, it comes back a little bit. So the in die thickness versus the out of die thickness is very close, but it's going to expand a little bit. This area is how much work is remaining in that tablet. We want our material to hold a lot of work, so it increases the robustness. This over here is an example of an elastic material. Um, as we increase our compaction pressure, our tablet gets thinner, thinner, and thinner. Here's our in die thickness. And notice with this material, when we release the load, the tablet is actually, my mouse, it's getting a lot thicker. So now there's less area in this curve, representing that the material is pushing out a lot of that energy. This area right here is the work of elasticity. If you've got a lot of area in here, your material has a lot of rebound and elastic recovery. This is not a great thing for tablet presses, especially when you're at high speed and you're hitting it real fast and your dwell time is very, very low. Uh, so again, plastic example, elastic material. So here's our data from the, uh, the APAP materials from 20, 40, and 60. This is our work and compression. We've given a value to it, the area under the curve here at 20% APAP, 40%, and 60%. The gray is the wet granulation blend, the blue is the direct compression, and the orange is the roller compacted blend. You'll notice at 20% drug load, we got our highest work of compression out of the wet granulated material, and as we increase the drug load, we're losing some of that work. So that work is going down with increasing the drug load. So this is representing the APAP is not a favorable material when it comes to robustness uh, of tableting. So the lower the amount of APAP, the stronger the tablet. But we need a high drug load so we can deliver the medicine to our patient. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we started with direct compression. And you'll notice the direct compression starts about 12.7 and it's dropping off. Then we tried roller compaction. Roller compaction will improve the flow. Direct compression blend had some flow issues, a high drug load. The roller compactor is going to increase the bulk density and improve the flow. But you'll notice that it didn't help us too much with the work of compaction. We actually lost some energy as compared to direct compression. But the wet granulation blend is superior out of all three uh, for this example here. The work of elasticity is representing how much of that energy is being pushed out. And you'll notice this curve is kind of flipped. So the work of elasticity, we're seeing that the roller compaction 
blend has the most elastic recovery uh, than the other two processes. The uh, blue is the direct compression, and the gray, again, is the wet granulation. So this curve's kind of flipped. Um, so this is a great example of how to uh, understand how much work you're putting into the material and how much is remaining to give us a robust tablet that's going to be scalable into high-speed manufacturing. Now the heckle plot, we're kind of validating the data I just uh, presented to you. The heckle plot is, uh, well, first of all, heckle is a Russian mathematician that developed an equation to understand how much pressure is needed for these particles to start to to deform and bond. What's the minimum amount of pressure applied to create bonding and making a tablet? That's what the heckle is all about. Uh, the y-axis is the log of one over E, where E is the porosity. So we're making one single tablet at one meter per second or whatever speed you're trying to run on your manufacturing press. As we increase our compaction pressure, we're understanding the consolidation. And at peak force, we then reduce the loading from the upper punch and we're measuring this as well, the decompression. So in the heckle, we are to take a linear uh, portion of this curve. So this right here is usually just the packing uh, consolidation, and then we get this linear portion here. We wanna get the, uh, the, uh, the slope of this curve here, and that number is real small, so we take the inverse of that, one over the slope. And then we do the same thing for the decompression event, and we find a linear portion here, and we get the slope. By getting this information, we can understand the degree of plastic deformation. This curve down here is very valuable. This is the yield of plastic deformation. And basically what this means, on the y-axis in megapascals of pressure, what is required to form a tablet? What's the minimum pressure applied on these particles that are needed to make a tablet? Well, you'll notice that the lowest one is the gray, the wet granulation blend. So you need the least amount of pressure on the wet granulation blend with 20% drug load to achieve a robust tablet or achieve a tablet. Uh, we're about 94.47 megapascal. And then when you go to direct compression, you need a little bit more pressure to achieve a tablet. And then the highest one is the roller compaction. So the most compactable material in this case would be for 20% drug load would be the wet granulation blend. Then it would be the direct compression and then the roller compaction. Now you'll notice as we increase the drug load, we follow a similar trend. And then when we went up to 60%, the, uh, the wet granulation actually went way up here. It's requiring more pressure to achieve that tablet. But the key thing here that we didn't talk about yet, uh, well, actually uh, uh, Aurelian went over this, is the flow properties. Um, if you can't get flow into your dye, there's no point of moving forward. That's the most and most important part of the rotary press process is are you going to get a full fill of material so you achieve your target weight? If you can't, go back to the drawing board and you have to fix this. Um, and here we're just really evaluating the compactibility of the material. Over here is a degree of elastic deformation. Uh, they all look very similar, especially at, at the 40%, um, but the, the roller compacted blend actually has given us the most elastic recovery. Okay, so that's the heckle plot and that's the work curve. Those are the things that we're evaluating on the presser. Okay. So again, we did a lot of focus on the compression event here. On our series two and series three, we're actually gonna run the rotary press and run compaction studies at different pressures for the different drug loads and strain rate sensitivity studies at different dwell times and tangential velocities. And we want to understand the dynamics of our formula on the rotary press. And for this, again, we focus on one compression event, looking at the consolidation, the dwell time, and decompression. By understanding all this information, looking at work curves and heckle, we can understand the deformation properties. We can understand what excipients we need to add to increase that robustness and scalability. One thing we did not talk about at all, there's a lot of other things we can look at, is different head flats. Here's a D tooling head flats and then B Bravo tooling head flats. When you order a punch, you get a standard head flat for a B and a D, but know that you can change these head flats. For example, you can make a 50% less head flat than the standard, or you can go to no head flat, or you can increase the head flat to an extended or even higher. Same thing with B tooling. By changing the head flat, we are going to change the dwell time. Now it's common for us to say, and there's a lot of literature on this, is that when we increase our head flat, we increase dwell time and we increase the robustness of our tablet. That's not always true. It's true in a lot of cases, uh, but there are some papers and research, especially we've done at 
the Tolley Institute and Long Island University where certain materials will benefit from a lower, smaller head flat. And what's happening there is we're slightly increasing the consolidation time. Now remember, I said consolidation time is a function of the compression roll diameter and the tangential velocity of the turret, but the head flat will also influence that consolidation time. So note that there are different head flaps available to you if you're having these capping issues, robustness issues, especially in manufacturing where you can't adjust the formula. Uh, we've got these backup tools here that can help you get your robustness you need to reduce the capping issues and so on. Uh, one other thing I want to note is there's different steel types there. So if you're having a sticking or picking issue, uh, there's different steel types and coatings available. If you have a very abrasive material, uh, we have different steels that will increase your tooling life and your press life uh, based off those materials. Uh, so a quick summary of what we discussed. We focused on the compression event for this series one. Series two and three, we're gonna talk about rotary press, compaction and uh, strain rate sensitivity studies. But we're trying to replicate our manufacturing machine compression event with the consolidation time, the dwell time, and the linear velocity or the tangential velocity. Many advantages to the emulator is we can use very limited amount of material, follow QBD approach, and understand the deformation properties, and understand what excipients are required to get this robust tablet that's scalable in manufacturing. So this emulator prevents all of these issues at early stage. This is very important at early stage. We wanna, we wanna push our product. We wanna know its failure points. Uh, there's too many products out there that we did not, they did not push their, their failure points and now they're in manufacturing at high speed and they got these issues. And the only way to fix those issues is by mechanically uh, changing tool design, head flats, uh, making sure the press is set up properly, using the correct punch penetration, pre-compression amount, things like that. But at the R&D bench level scale, you want to fix all of these problems. You want to address any of these issues you might find. So by using stuff like the emulator and the presser, uh, even the RD30, which we'll talk about in series two and three, this will allow you to identify these issues at early stage so you can fix them. Okay. All right, at this stage, I want to say thank you for your attention and I'm going to hand it back over to Carrie. Thank you, Robert. Um, today's webinar was the first of our series on tablet formulation techniques. Next week on February 8th, we will be providing our second webinar on dry granulation and subsequent tableting techniques with Alexander Work. It would be great if you can fill, the, fill out the feedback form provided by the QR code and let us know how you liked our combined webinar. Um, today, it looks like we have time for a few questions. I see from the chat that we have a few questions for Aurelian and Robert. Aurelian, um, sorry. Uh, how can we determine the threshold above which the powder becomes unprocessable in the tableting machine? So uh, that's that's a very good question. So uh, actually, what you need to do is you have to uh, correlate the characterization method with with what you uh, observe in your process. So Robert just. Uh, uh, introduced us on a uh, compaction emulator. So what you do, you have your formulation, you characterize it, uh, for example, with the tap density analysis, then you look in the emulator how the powder behaves so that you are able to define a threshold. And then you have all the picture. You, you, you know the raw material properties, you know how this raw material will behave in the process, because you have to understand if you change the process, uh, maybe some process will require different powder properties and so on. So you'd always need, need both, actually. So powder characterization, you define the threshold in the process, and then you can classify your different formulation and know beforehand, okay, this one will be problematic and this one will be good. Thank you, Captain Val. And Robert, when analyzing Heckel and Burke plots, does Natoli use in die or out of die measurements? Yeah, that's actually a great question. I, I talked about it early in the presentation, um, but it's in die measurements. It's not out of die. Um, there's a lot of uh, research done out there with out of die, which it offers some value. Uh, but in die is the best way of evaluating workers and heckle plots. 
And in order to do in die, I mentioned this as well, it is so critical to understand the machine deformation properties. Like I said, when, when punches come together and start compressing the material, the machine wants to deform. The tooling deforms, the machine stretches, you have to compensate for that and add that into the software program as a calibration factor. So at any given kilonewton of force, uh, we are understanding how much the machine is stretching and we're correcting for that. Um, so th that's very critical. Uh, and, and like I said earlier as well, there are machines out there that claim to do heckles and work curves, and they are, but most of them are at a die. Uh, the in die is really the, the valuable information uh, for evaluating you know, uh, deformation properties. A lot of things happen after you eject the tablet, it expands, some of them don't, they actually get a little smaller depending on your properties and material. So understanding that real-time tablet thickness as we're compressing and what that peak force in die thickness is, and then as the tablet where the force is released, we're understanding the elastic recovery. Uh, so INDI is the best way of uh, evaluating all of these deformation properties. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great, great, thank you, Robert. Um, so it looks like that's all we have time for today. Um, but again, on behalf of Notorious Scientific and Granny Tools, uh, we thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you next week on February 8th for our next webinar in this series. Please stay safe and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.